Good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. I'm Max Bergman. I'm the director of the Europe, Russia, Eurasia program and the Stuart Center here at the Center for, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, and today our team is very excited to announce the release of our latest report, uh, Out of Stock, Assessing the Impact of Sanctions on the Russian Defense Industry. Uh, and you can get it on our website and, and print out a copy yourselves and follow along or just or see uh, or, or just download it virtually and, and read it however you want to read a, a long report. Uh, I think it's a really important report and we have a, a really good uh, uh, panel with us today to discuss it. I'm going to start by maybe outlining some of the highlights and then we'll turn uh, to, to our guests who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, to, to, to go through it in, in some detail and really talk about how sanctions and export controls are impacting uh, the Russian defense industry and Russia's ability to wage war uh, in Ukraine. Um, the report examines uh, the overall impact of Western sanctions and allied export regulations on Russia's defense sector to date, as well as the Kremlin's ability to overcome them. So it's, it's also looking at how Russia can essentially get around sanctions and, and steps that Russia is using as well. It analyzes Russia's supply and production of the core weapons and systems, including tanks, missiles, uncrewed aerial vehicles, aircraft, and electronic warfare systems. It also looks at the key foreign components restricted by the allied export control measures. And when I say allied export control measures, it's important to note this is not just the effort of the United States. Uh, the European Union, UK, and other allies have very much participated uh, in the sanctions and export control efforts and have their own sanctions uh, and export control regimes that are, are trying to take action against, uh, against Russia and prevent them from getting supplies and components. Uh, it also looks at uh, key foreign components restricted uh, ne that are needed to produce high-end uh, Russian defense technology, such as the optics, bearings, machine tools, engines, and microchips. Uh, the report then examines uh, Kremlin's import substitution efforts, basically Russia's efforts to produce the technology uh, and equipment uh, on its own without having to rely on foreign components. Let me provide just a few of the takeaways. So what's the beef, I think, in this report? Uh, the first is that I think sanctions, we can say sanctions and export controls are having uh, an impact, a tangible impact on, uh, on Russia, on the Russian defense industry. Uh, they, however, should not be seen as a magic bullet that will uh, end the war or, or, uh, or simply uh, 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 shift the tide necessarily of, of events uh, on the battlefield. But they are degrading Russia's defense industrial capacity, which is harming Russia's ability to ramp up production and replace the equipment damaged or destroyed by Ukraine's forces. Russia is also experiencing shortages of higher-end foreign engines, optical systems, bearings, and microchips, forcing its defense industry to rely on older and inferior quality alternatives. This in turn, I think, affects the quality of weapon systems produced and deployed in Ukraine from tanks to missiles, which we'll talk about in a second. However, these shortages will not entirely prevent Moscow from carrying out battlefield operations. Um, so although the Russian military has been compelled, I think, to use uh, less technology sophisticated items and bring you know, older equipment to the battlefield, uh, Russia also has a lot of capacity. It has demonstrated a remarkable skill, I think, and resilience when it comes to acquiring restricted dual-use components and then also uh, figuring out ways to uh, keep its forces supplied. It has uh, large reserves and, and is, is now relying on those reserves and so therefore will be able to continue fighting, maybe not at, uh, at the same uh, rate or level that it had previously. Uh, I think sanctions have also made Moscow opt for a slower-paced attritional campaign as sanctions are putting continuous pressure on Russia's military and industrial base. The Kremlin's current war strategy, therefore, is centered around depleting Ukraine's uh, weapon stocks by carrying out a slow-paced attritional campaign aimed at exhausting Western aid. And to close uh, my initial summary, I think what we're essentially seeing is the quality of Russia's equipment going down while what we hope to see is the quality of Ukraine's equipment going up as it receives uh, increasing supplies uh, from the West. And it points to the critical role uh, that the West will play in continuing to, to arm Ukraine. Um, and I should also say this report was really a, a team effort uh, led by Maria Snegovaya, who we'll introduce in a minute, uh, also Tina, Do Tina uh, Dobaya 
uh, and Nick Fenton uh, of CSIS, and also uh, Sam Bendit, who's here with us today as well, uh, was a really key con contributor. And I also want to thank all the outside experts, including Paul Schwartz, who's also here with us today, uh, and a number of others from the, from the think tank community uh, who, who assessed this report and I think um, have really made it better. So this was a team effort, not just here at CSIS, but I think in the, in the broader community. So with that, let me introduce my panelists. Uh, first, I'll start with my colleague uh, and friend, Maria Snegavaya. Maria is a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia with the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program here at CSIS. Uh, and is a postdoctoral fellow in Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. She studies Russia, Russia's domestic and foreign policy, as well as democratic backsliding in post-communist Europe and the tactics used by Russian actors and proxies who exploit uh, the, the dynamics in the region. Marie holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and leads our team's work uh, here at CSIS, CSIS on Russia and Eurasia. And she's one of the leading scholars, I think, especially around town on sanctions and, and export controls. Uh, we next have Sam Bendit, who's joining us virtually today. Uh, thanks for being here, Sam. Uh, he's an advisor with the Russia, Russia Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis and an adjunct senior fellow uh, with the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for New American Security, CNAS. Uh, his research focuses on Russian defense and technology developments, uncrewed robotic autonomous military systems. He's really one of the, the leading global experts when it comes to uh, UAVs. Uh, he's also an expert on artificial intelligence and Russian military capabilities. And prior to joining CNA, Sam worked at the National Defense University on emerging and disruptive technologies to aid the Department of Defense in responding to domestic and international crisis situations. We're thrilled to have Sam here today, and we're incredibly excited uh, to work with him uh, as a contributor to this report. He really played a, a critical role in helping to steer our research and analysis, and we're looking forward to collaborating with him uh, more in the future as well. Um, thanks for joining us, Sam. Uh, last but certainly not least is Paul Schwartz, uh, who is a, who's a, a, a new non-resident uh, senior associate with CSIS uh, with the Europe, Russia, Eurasia program. Uh, his research portfolio is focused on the Russian military and its defense and security policy. He has been involved in numerous studies on Russia's military strategy, capabilities, and doctrine, uh, recent campaigns in Ukraine, Syria, and Georgia, military modernization and arms sales programs, and Russia's defense industrial base. So all things Russian uh, military defense. Uh, prior to being with us at CSIS, uh, Paul had a long career in the legal profession at Hogan and Hartson, a DC-based uh, international law firm, and at uh, SAIC and Digital Equipment Corporation, two premier uh, U.S. defense companies. And Paul was one of the peer reviewers on this project, as I mentioned, uh, and really gave us excellent feedback. So thank you uh, all again for being here. Before we go further, I would also like to add that this event was funded by the Russia Strategic Initiative of the U.S. European Command, uh, and the views expressed in this publication do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or the United States government. Uh, and a big thank you to our colleagues at RSI for their support on this project. Okay. With that, I think let's turn to some of the report, and I want to uh, turn to you, Sam, first to sort of break this down, I think, system by system. I sort of outlined some of our broader conclusions, but maybe we could, we could start sort of going through, you know, key critical systems um, and, and how sanctions and export controls may be impacting Russia's ability to, to replace them. So maybe, maybe we, uh, you know, we could start with tanks, but we can, you know, turn it over to you for, 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 inter uh, for, for beginning comments. Thank you, Max. It's great to be uh, with you all, and uh, thank you for organizing this event. Thank you for including me uh, in this report. Uh, we took a lot of um, time to sort of review a lot of open source and unclassified information. I think we should carry out the report with that as well. So we took a look at a lot of public data, and a lot of public data came from multiple sources. So we tried to kind of reconcile the information that we had and sort of um, strike the golden middle with respect to what information is actually believable and what information should be reviewed as part of the unknown information environment as part of the war. The first section um, in our um, report deals with tanks. Obviously, it is the most important weapon that Russia, or well, one of the most important weapons that Russian military has at its arsenal. Uh, it started the war with a large number of tanks, far greater than um, anything in the Ukrainian arsenal, both um, in the field and, of course, in storage. Throughout the war, the Russian military lost uh, a very large number of tanks. The Ukrainian countermeasure, especially the anti tank weapon. But also, we have discovered that Russian military has started taking a lot of older equipment out of storage. 
So uh, while a lot of Russian tanks were lost in so weeks and months of the war, um, Russian military started sort of replenishing a lot of models like the T-72s with some of the slightly you know, the T-63s and even T-55s. These tanks went through vast modernization in one way or another, or they went through a, a sort of a rush modernization to simply put tanks in the field. We have discovered that despite a lot of losses, Russian military maintains the capacity to fight and to fight the Ukrainians across the entire front when it comes to the state warfare. So I think you really bring up a, a really important point on the um, on on the difficulty of finding data and information. Uh, that this was a, a, a report that relied on unclassified information uh, that was open to the public. Uh, we didn't have access to any classified materials. But what we tried to do, maybe you could talk a little bit about this. But looking at um, Orex, the the Dutch open source uh, intelligence website that really keeps track of um, of a, a lot of equipment that's been damaged. Uh, and then using that as sort of one poll where they need, I think, uh, visual evidence to sort of document something versus looking at what the Ukrainian military was saying publicly and using that as kind of two polls to then sort of make make some determinations. Well, again, this was a very interesting sort of exercise in uh, open source analytics because uh, Oryx, uh, which has been absolutely excellent over the past year in compiling all of the open source information, um, as well as the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and the Ukrainian government that have been also putting out daily updates, really have sort of different numbers. And uh, so we try to understand exactly where the actual losses fit, because some um, some images of destroyed equipment uh, was finally counted twice, uh, some images were older, uh, some images were repeated uh, on social media over and over. Uh, and so we try to understand exactly where the tank losses are actually uh, should be estimated. And so we obviously took a look at uh, Oryx as one of the most authoritative sources, and we obviously paid attention to what the Ukrainian government was putting out. And so the result is thousands of tanks lost, but also thousands of over vehicles which are entering the field. Because this paper took some time to put together, when we started drafting the text, uh, we estimated that Russia is going to take a lot of older tanks out of storage. And by now, by middle of April of 2023, that's exactly what's happened. In fact, one of the latest pictures on social media that's circulating is a Russian T-55 main battle tank, which uh, basically traces its development to the mid-50s. So Russia may have lost some of its more modern equipment, but it is probably and evidently making new equipment that is many, many decades old, and it's continuing to push against the Ukrainian defense. And let me ask you also about that, that it, it strikes me there, Russia is both looking at some of its older Soviet reserve uh, equipment in, in, um, in Cold War era tanks, the T-55, but we've also seen them bring into the battlefield T-90 tanks, so some of the more modern tanks that we didn't see in the beginning of the war. What, do you th what does that sort of tell you? Well, uh, Russian Russian defense industry, Russian government have claimed that they're going to manufacture a large number of main battle tanks this year to replenish the losses. Uh, they gave an estimate of roughly 1,500 modern main battle tanks that are supposed to enter service. That is probably unrealistic considering the state of the Russian defense industry today, and especially the state of the of its tank manufacturing. Uh, the T-90M and uh, and other tanks are few in numbers to begin with. Uh, and obviously, in order to uh, press its advantage against the Ukrainians, Russians have to put uh, all of its weapons into the field. But uh, we saw just a few T-90s in the field compared to an absolutely huge number of T-72s and some of the T-80s that were lost. We're starting to see losses amongst the T-62s and possibly even older main battle tanks, which are making their way to the front. And so we have to, again, um, take the Russian statement sort of uh, with a grain of salt with respect to the claims of large-scale manufacturing, what's likely going to happen is a modernization of a large number of older things with some of the um, equipment, such as communication systems, electronics, and other components. So we're going to see more upgraded T-72s, possibly T-62s, and maybe even T-55s as well. Right, so essentially, you know, Russia may be taking tanks out of storage, older Cold War era tanks, but they're they're not just sending them as is into the into the right. battlefield, right? So they, they are trying to take steps to make them uh, more modern fighting vehicles. Correct. And so in that, uh, I guess one sort of broader question, maybe I'll bring you in, uh, Paul, as, as well, on this question. I guess 
what impact will this have on the battlefield if they're using uh, less quality, uh, or if their tanks are not at the, the same level as they were uh, at, at the beginning of the war? Maybe, maybe Sam, if you want to start, and Paul, you want to comment. Well, I, I think it all comes down to how strong are Ukrainian defenses. Because if Ukrainian defenders have modern anti-tank weapons, if they continue to have uh, modern artillery systems, if they continue to deploy a large number of ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets like UAVs to monitor Russian movements, uh, the Russian tanks may be in trouble. But the Russian tanks are strong only as the Ukrainian defenses are weak. And if the Russian tanks are going to be used in combined arms formation, together with aviation, artillery, infantry, the way they're supposed to be used, then even older things can have a significant impact on the battlefield. But again, even a modernized, older Soviet tank can be in trouble against a very modern Western-supplied anti-tank weapon, which is in service to Ukraine right now. Yeah, I would gen, uh, generally tend to agree with that. Uh, we, we're the, Just the fact that they are able to uh, field a mix of systems, that's going to have its greatest impact at the tactical level, where before you relying on more advanced sensors and targeting systems for their best frontline tanks. Now they're, they're relying on some of the older systems, which don't have quite as good protection. Their uh, fire control systems are not as good. Their communications may not be as, as uh, effective as well. And at the tactical level where they're facing troops in the field, either other tanks or uh, direct, direct fire weapons, javelin missiles and so forth, they'll pay a price for that. But the campaign is likely to be decided at the operational level of war. And the Russians and the Soviets before them have uh, often been able to overcome superior weapons capability of some of their adversaries by bringing to bear compensating systems like artillery and air power. Electronic warfare has had a big effect in uh, Ukraine. And so ultimately, I, as long as there, there's not a, they don't reach a tipping point where there's such a market technological imbalance that it starts to really have an impact at the operational level, the Russians are likely to be able to, to, be able to use these tanks effectively mm -hmm. in fairly large numbers to, to support their uh, war objectives. And what do we know about the Russian defense industry and its ability to build new tanks, to recapitalize uh, the, uh, and modernize the tanks that um, it has in storage? Uh, I saw that Dmitry uh, Medvedev, uh, the former Russian president, who's now deputy head of the Russian Security Council, uh, claimed that the Russian uh, defense industry could produce 1,500 um, main battle tanks this year. Uh, that was sort of dismissed by, by many. But what do we know of, um, uh, about Russia's ability to produce tanks, and is that being, being degraded? Sam, maybe over to you. Well, the overall uh, manufacturing of tanks is not significantly impacted by uh, the sanctions, considering that most of the technology needed for uh, Russian tanks manufacturing is actually homegrown and domestic and has been so for quite a while. But as we have indicated, uh, some of the more modern equipment, which is already lost, has to be replaced by the older equipment, which may not be quite as good, may not be quite as high tech. And this is where uh, this is going to have a, a more significant impact, as Paul just mentioned. Uh, even a modernized main battle tank is only as good as that modernized equipment that's installed on it. And if, it, if the modernization uh, takes into consideration some of the older equipment, then it is going to suffer at the tactical level again as long as Ukrainians maintain a robust anti-tank capability. Great. Maybe we'll we'll switch gears, uh, Sam, and and and, and I'll, let me ask you about missiles because this is obviously incredibly important topic. The Russian uh, Russia's ability uh, to to maintain its missile stockpiles to to put Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian civilian infrastructure under threat uh, is a major part of this war. Um, what are you seeing when it comes to uh, the Russian missile, missile stockpiles? Well, according to all of the open source data we've analyzed, we've seen the ebb and flow of the Russian missile use. There were periods, weeks and months, when uh, Russian missile use was intensified, and then at some point, the missile use is actually fallen off. Uh, we have seen Russia use a lot less of the smart advanced capabilities, uh, and uh, over time, Russian military has grown to rely on some of its older, less sophisticated missile stuff. But uh, the missiles weren't necessarily used by themselves. They were used in conjunction with other weapons like 
long range war ammunition or these which is uh, something that we would probably get fairly soon in this conversation. Uh, the manufacturing of uh, Russian advanced missiles and the precision guided munitions has been impacted, but probably not to the extent where it uh, prevented the development and manufacturing of these weapons. In fact, the, the manufacturing of missiles is ongoing and will probably continue into 2023, but probably in smaller numbers. And so the Russian military is going to use its long range missiles in um, sort of very pinpointed fashion, going after high value targets across Ukraine, especially some of the military targets and dual use targets, such as energy infrastructure. And one of the things that I think, you know, through some, some work of, of other colleagues in the think tank field have gone and, and you know, looked at some of the Russian missiles and, and seen that there's uh, some of these missiles have been constructed fairly recently. Uh, what right. does that tell you about the Russian defense industry's ability to kind of keep manufacturing these systems? Well, it tells us that Russian military has exhausted some of its uh, stocks of these missiles, but that it actually continues to and is able to uh, manufacture other uh, missiles as needed as well to try and replenish those that were lost. Uh, we're also seeing that some of the uh, more advanced missiles are probably kept sort of um, uh, for um, other uh, military or for subsequent military action. Uh, maybe they're kept for additional campaigns or maybe they're kept in store. Uh, for uh, other strikes. Uh, again, we're seeing a lot of missile strikes conducted by slightly older uh, repurposed equipment, such as some of the sea based missiles or even some of the um, uh, air defense missiles that have been repurposed for the strikes. Not all of the uh, Russian missile strikes are successful, but almost all of the missile strikes land somewhere in Ukraine. So even a less sophisticated equipment could cause a significant damage uh, in, in Ukraine, especially when it comes to civilian targets. Right, I've seen um, you know a discussion that the Russians aren't aren't too concerned if the accuracy of their uh, missiles sort of uh, you know uh, goes goes down because they're still if you're firing at civilian infrastructure you're still able to to cause cause havoc. Um, I want to maybe ask about the S three hundred and their use of air defense systems in an offensive way. Um, is that? Uh, is that uh, that strikes me as a sign also that Russia is having to really kind of change operations. Are those systems, you know, they're obviously intended for defense, but uh, is that is that something that we've seen in other conflicts? Is that a standard procedure that you know, if you're under fire and you have air defense missiles, you can tur make turn them into offensive? I'm curious from a, from a military perspective, um, what does that say about Russia's forces? Well, most uh, S-300 missiles are used in air defense capability. They're designed to have a uh, relatively small aerial target. They're not really designed uh, to hit land on. But again, a missile is a missile. And in this sense, uh, it can still work uh, since uh, it basically flies as any other um, missile designed to hit ground targets. The fact that Russians have been shooting them shows a level of versatility, but it also shows a level of desperation in turning to technology that is not originally designed to hit ground targets. And when it comes to Russia's ability to produce these systems, one of the things that uh, has been noted is that they do depend on a lot of microelectronics and other Western-made uh, components. Um, is your sense that Russia is struggling to continue to build these systems because they are, have lost access? Uh, to Western components? Well, we looked at uh, a lot of public data and uh, some of the subsequent sections of the report that we'll discuss later will shed more light on that. But we have seen uh, Russian government and uh, Russian military becoming more and more versatile by the month in trying to import different types of components, especially microelectronics, which are suitable for missiles. Again, going off public data, we had a sort of a certain aperture <laughs> into uh, how this is conducted. But uh, we're getting the sense that despite some of the problems experienced by the Russian defense industry, a sort of a slow uh, roll, a low level production of missiles is still going to continue for the foreseeable future. Right. And I think, and we'll bring, uh, I'll bring Maria in, in in a bit to kind of talk about how Russia's adapting, but it raises one of these questions of whether Russia has you know, had a stockpile of these uh, microelectronics or uh, are somehow figuring out ways to, to smuggle them in. Uh, but maybe we can turn to uh, the uncrewed aerial vehicles, UAVs, 
Uh, there was obviously a ton of attention when Russia uh, uh, inked a deal with the Iranians, and, and you see uh, uh, Iranian made uh, UAVs uh, uh, attacking uh, Ukrainian uh, civilian targets and Ukrainian targets. Um, what does that say about uh, Russia's own UAV capacity, uh, and what's the threat now posed by those systems? Well, in many ways, the use of UAVs and drones has been the most visible aspect of the war because a lot of these drones were used in the information gathering and information gathering capacity as intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets. And so plenty of videos on the uh, social media platforms are actually UAV provided. Uh, Russian military led into the war in Ukraine with a supposedly large number of military UAVs, although most of them were in the ISR capacity, the like very few combat UAVs. A large number of these ISR drones were lost to Ukraine on countermeasures, especially <coughs> electronic warfare, and also um, to some of the um, errors on, uh, on on the Russian pilot side. But uh, even these losses have not prevented Russians from continuing to field these drones. Again, most of them are ISR drones. They're lighter and smaller than some of the few combat drones that Russia had in its arsenal. Uh, combat drones have been relegated in some ways to uh, supporting capacity because most of the combat drones that Russian military fields today, the Orion and the Fort Post kinds, are actually large, um, fairly slow flying and low flying machines, so they can be susceptible to air defense. And so some of them have advanced optics and therefore they provide um, ISR capability to some of the companion drones that the Russian military is fielding. For example, loading munitions such as uh, its own Lancet and Poop as well as other types of drones. But uh, Russian military, as well as the Ukrainian military, have also turned to the commercial drones, uh, which are used in very, very large numbers by practically all belligerents in this war. And that's the Chinese-made DJI hotel drones, as well as some of the uh, self-made um, sort of group yourself type uh, FPV drones, the, um, um, the racing drones, which are now used as one-way kamikaze drones. And so uh, some of the capabilities which were lost because of uh, uh, the absence of military type ISR drones have been uh, now filled repeatedly and quite successfully by these commercial drones. And a lot has been written about it. It's probably one of the biggest sort of um, uh, analytical body of work related to this war, um, again, um, on the UAVs and drones. But Russian military also showed its versatility by turning to Iran and acquiring a very large number of its one-way loading munition kamikaze kind of drones, which I had 136 and 131, which fly under Russian names of Gerain 1 and Gerain 2, actually can fly for hundreds of kilometers. And uh, they have repeatedly uh, caused a lot of damage across Ukraine. They have put a lot of stress on the uh, Ukrainian air defenses, and uh, they've actually did a lot of Ukrainian energy infrastructure, as well as some of the other civilian and military targets. And this is a, a UAV capability that the Russian military is going to grow, it is going to develop and continue to rely upon. Its relationship with Iran is burgeoning. Its military to military cooperation is growing. So you should expect Russia to possess a larger number of these long range UAVs. So Russia has actually been able to use its military type drones, its imported learning munitions, as well as commercial technologies relatively successfully at different points of the war and in different, po uh, at different parts of the front. But uh, Russia is also looking at what Ukraine is doing, and a lot of the um, technical uh, advantages and a lot of the technical breakthroughs are actually going to come from the Ukrainians, especially in the more successful use of commercial and FTV type of drones. Interesting and fascinating. The maybe just a, a quick follow up on the uh, on the Shahid 136 and the the, uh, the Iranian drones. It, it we had. There was a lot of attention paid to them, I think, uh, a few months ago when they were first sort of um, introduced into, into the war. Um, we're, we're hearing a bit less about them now, just from uh, if, if you're sort of generically following the news. Uh, have, have the Ukrainians figured out how to counter them in a way that is both effective and cost effective? So both to that, that it's not sort of depleting Ukrainian air defense. How, how are the Ukrainians defending against them? Well, mostly, yes. Uh, up to 90% of the Shahed attacks are actually shut down, and the Ukrainians are able to destroy a very large number of these drones. They're quite loud. Uh, they have a very simple engine. Uh, they fly uh, at a relatively uh, low distance to the ground, and they can be sighted visually and then audibly, and uh, 
information about that could be passed on to the Ukrainian defendants. Ukraine would need a number of systems and weapons to defend against these drones. Um, there, no single drone should be allowed to pass, because even one Shaheed that makes it past the, the Ukrainian defenses can cause significant damage, especially when it comes to stationary Ukrainian energy infrastructure, which has been impacted so much during this winter. Uh, the Ukrainians are using any number of weapons, including uh, large caliber machine guns, kind of World War II and Cold War style um, close range air defense. They're using more sophisticated missiles, radar enabled guns, and of course, they're using uh, more expensive missiles. The whole point about defending their Shaheed is that uh, the cost of their defense should be brought down to the point where it is uh, cheaper to defend against uh, the Shaheed than to actually shoot it down. And this has been the problem not just with Russian use of Shaheed, but with other uh, use of these type of drones against other targets across the Middle East, where some of the countries, for example, in the Middle East that rely on very expensive air defense systems to shoot down the drone that costs less than $50,000. And this is why this drone is so attractive to the Russian military. It is relatively cheap. It is made mostly with civilian components, civilian components that could be acquired quite easily, apparently, circumventing all kinds of sanctions. And so Russia is either going to assemble this stone from its supply by Iran, or it is going to assemble it on a wholesale from um, blueprints that are provided uh, by Iran. In fact, there's plans apparently to build a factory deep inside Russia to manufacture 6,000 of these Shahids. Russia is also launching them now from Russian territory proper, um, which makes it more difficult for uh, the Ukrainian military to target the launch points. But it is possible to defend against them. But again, the cost of this defense should definitely go down, which is why Ukrainians are starting to use uh, cheaper, less sophisticated, large caliber machine guns against these communities. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one last question when it comes to UAVs. So, so the role of China and in particularly the, the low cost commercial uh, UAVs, there was, uh, you know, I think we note in the report that. Um, a lot of these UAVs could just be purchased through AliExpress, kind of the, the eBay or Amazon Chinese equivalent. Uh, but we did see some action from, uh, from one of the Chinese companies to sort of restrict some, uh, some of the, the use of these drones on the battlefield. What are we seeing there in terms of uh, Chinese support for, for, for Russia? Well, officially, Chinese company DJI, uh, which then factors the vast majority, of commercial drones going by old religion, uh, old religion, especially Russia, has officially announced that it is not selling these drones in Russia and Ukraine because it doesn't want to keep the drones in the war. But unofficially, these drones could be purchased from any number of online and physical platforms, such as AliExpress, where most of these drones and their components are actually bought. At, at some point this spring, uh, DJI, I'm sorry, AliExpress tried to uh, try to prevent customers in Russia proper from purchasing these UAVs through AliExpress, but that was a very um, sort of short-term measure, and uh, I believe the, the purchases are still to its union. A large number of these uh, commercial drones are purchased by volunteers, uh, by Russian volunteers, and supplied to the farm. And so obviously there are still ways where these drones could be manufactured, uh, excuse me, uh, could be acquired and delivered to the Russians. So it is really possible to prevent the flow of this commercial technology to the front simply because it is first and foremost a commercial technology manufactured in large number for literally the entire world. <clears throat> right. Maybe let's turn to, to aircraft. Now, the Russian Air Force has been less engaged uh, in this war than, than the Russian Army, no doubt. Uh, but the impact of sanctions and export controls would likely have a real impact on, on the Russian aviation sector, particularly the defense aviation sector. So maybe you could talk about that a bit, Sam. Yes, uh, what we have seen is that the Russian military has been using uh, a relatively small number of its aircraft against the Ukrainians. Uh, a significant number of aircraft were lost the mission. Uh, but we're also seeing the fact that the departure of Western companies, especially uh, going in Airbus, uh, is forcing the Russian civilian airline market, for example, uh, the aircraft market, to uh, cannibalize all their equipment, to really uh, try to keep a lot of the uh, aircraft that flows by disassembling other uh, other aircraft parts. Uh, a lot of uh, Russian military aircraft obviously were built with domestic components, and uh, uh, these supply chains have been around for uh, quite a few decades. But some of the more modern, sophisticated equipment still rely on uh, modern technology. And so we are seeing, at least on the civilian side, a significant impact on the quality 
and the state of the Russian um, airline industry, and especially its aircraft manufacturing industry. A lot of these plans are probably going to be a whole Russian aircraft industry going to manufacture a lot less aircraft, and that is probably going to impact how Russian military is going to use its own aircraft against the Ukrainians. Russian military was also apparently a little bit larger with Iran by supplying Iran with more sophisticated aircraft in exchange for uh, different types of technologies such as aerial drones. So uh, Russian military is trying to adapt to the Ukrainian air defense, trying to adapt how it is flying these aircraft uh, in combat. But again, uh, the Russian aircraft have not been a significant factor in this war, at least not until now. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe finally for, uh, for you, the uh, electronic warfare systems. Uh, EW has been really important, I think, uh, in this war. And I, I guess the question there is, you know, these systems uh, are probably not being degraded on the battlefield as much, or are they? Um, and then, uh, so is there a same uh, challenge of, of production for the Russians being able to maintain their kind of EW systems. And maybe you could talk about EW as a electronic warfare, as a, as, a, as a concept as well. Well, in many ways, Russian military is a leader in electronic warfare, having invested significant capacity and driven out this specific military branch. Electronic warfare is basically an arm of tracking and suppressing enemy communications by jamming different types of communication frequencies by impacting about aircraft, satellites, uh, UAVs are communicating on the ground, how soldiers communicating with each other. And so Russian military has fielded a number of systems over the last two decades of uh, different sizes and caliber and missions uh, for their electronic warfare forces. Uh, and in Ukraine, uh, one would expect EW <coughs> forces to have a very significant impact and be quite successful against the Ukrainians. And in some ways, that's actually the case. Ukrainians are already saying our Russian electronic warfare is impacting their small UAV operation. Ukrainians are saying how large parts of the front um, have uh, communications impacted because of Russian government. But electronic warfare, by its very nature, is not a 24 7, 365 type of thing when it comes to the Russian military. The systems do not work repeatedly um, around the clock, they sometimes work only for several hours. Electronic warfare can cover parts of the front. Uh, but not the entire front. And the Ukrainians have been very successful in exploiting it. And electronic warfare uh, systems are also dependent on some of the Western and the international components like microchips and, uh, and other supplies. And so, in some ways, the uh, Russian Italian defense industry has also been impacted by the sanctions. At the same time, we're seeing uh, Russian military continuing to field different types of EW systems against different types of threats, especially <coughs> against smaller type commercial type UAVs, which the Russian military considers one of its biggest threats today. Great. Well, th thank you for that uh, overview, Sam. I think maybe we want to turn from focusing on the on individual systems to maybe the the components and and, and the the tools needed to make some of those systems. And Paul, I want to turn it over to you uh, because it's not simply that um, that sanctions are impacting you know missiles, but they're also impacting things like bearings and machine tools and, and optical systems. Maybe we, we, you know, the report goes into some of, and to sort of analyzes each of these. Maybe we could start with sort of the optical systems and, and w why are those important and, and what are the impacts that we're seeing sure. of sanctions? So Russia's defense industry is heavily reliant on Western optical equipment, which is incorporated in a wide range of Russian systems, aircraft, helicopters, tanks and armored vehicles. And the, the paper highlights especially the role of French thermal imagers, which have been incorporated onto Russia's best frontline tanks and armored vehicles. They've been uh, added as a component of Russia's Sosna U targeting system, for example. And these are important because they give Russia certain advantages over their Ukrainian counterparts in ability to detect enemy targets at longer range and at night and to do so in a passive nature that doesn't disclose one's own uh, location. Um, and so these have been important, at, especially at the tactical level for, I think there's quite a bit of uh, discussion that Russian systems, despite their heavy losses, have been fairly effective when used properly in Ukraine and superior in many respects to some of their Ukrainian counterparts. 
Um, but since the cutoff of uh, sanctions, it's access to these particular units have been degraded. And what we're seeing is some of the newer upgraded versions of tanks that have been released onto the battlefield. They're, they're not being sent out there with the Cessna U or with some of the other French systems or other I, uh, IR systems that Russia has been importing from the West. And so they're using uh, legacy Russian systems that are inferior in nature, less capable, uh, less backed up by computer processing technology. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's caused a degradation in performance for optics. Right, and so, so in some of what we talked about earlier with Sam, that the Russians may be trying to modernize some of their older, you know, Stalin era, Stalinist era, era mm -hmm. tanks, but then they don't necessarily have the same equipment that they would, uh, that they have for, for some of their other modern tanks. Is that, that That's absolutely right. In fact, uh, there are probably limitations. You just can't take a component that's designed to work on one tank and, and uh, seamlessly uh, fit it onto an older uh, you know, T T55 or T62. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, those those do need adjustment. Now Russia's fairly capable of doing that, uh, but I do I I think what you're going to see is that, given the need for mass quantity, pulling tanks out of storage, refurbishing them, uh, trying to make sure that you can field them more more quickly rather than going through long adjustment process to incorporate more components. Uh, will affect uh, the quality of the tanks that they field onto the battlefield. Right, and then it also will require, you know, you will have people trained in operating different types of tanks than, than perhaps the ones that they're using, and that is that would affect their kind of tactical performance. Absolutely. In fact, um, just using some of these old tanks, of course, you, you suffer from the same problem, because right. that's not the tanks that are Russia's frontline uh, uh, motorized rifle units are, have been using, so they got that adjustment. but. Right, it's a training issue on how to properly use a different system that takes experience, uh, lessons learned, which can be quite costly. And so uh, there's some, some challenges incorporating that into their doctrine. Yeah, I, I, it's sort of, maybe this is a bad analogy, but I sort of struggle now to drive a car that doesn't have a, uh, a, a rear-facing camera that helps me uh, parallel park. Yeah. Uh, there, sort of, there's yeah. another issue I should mention too, and that is logistics challenges. When Russia's bringing all these systems out of storage, mm -hmm and fielding this uh, very diverse set of uh, ground combat systems in Ukraine, they have to sustain them. Yeah. And uh, they already had suffered from the fact that they had three main battle tanks, three frontline tanks that they were using of various different uh, varieties. And just sustaining that has, has been a major challenge for Russia. That's interesting, because that's some of the challenges Ukrainians are facing with all these different varieties of, of equipment. The Russians right. are probably experiencing that some ways too. Maybe let's talk about bearings. What are bearings? Why are yeah. they important? And, and how are, what is the role of sanctions there? Right, and I, I want to commend the, the authors for focusing on bearings because it's a subject that has been understudied somewhat in looking at sanctions and their impact. But bearings are essentially load-bearing items, usually manufactured of alloys and high-temperature steel. And uh, they're used in a wide range of Russian weapon systems. In fact, they're they're universally required for tanks, armored vehicles, uh, motor vehicles of all kinds used to in logistics, for example. They're used in civilian applications which have uh, military implications such as railway cars, heavy machinery for Russia's manufacturing industry. And so they are critical and Russia has been reliant on Western bearings and to some extent Chinese as well uh, for uh, all of these different applications because they're superior in quality. Uh, since the uh, sanctions have been imposed, however, Russia has been turning to import substitution using domestic bearings more and more than forced to to some extent. But the problem is that Russia's metallurgical processes to uh, produce the, the best bearings, is, is they have shortcomings and that causes problems in terms of more frequent breakdowns, shorter lifespans, and uh, that, that's having some impact on logistics as well. And, and so, there are, will they have to turn more to, to China for for a lot of these bear, for, for for bearings? Is that? Yeah, they're going to probably tr uh, take a uh, two prong or multi prong approach, import substitution coupled with importing those uh, bearings where they can get their hands on them from China and from a variety of countries. Mm -hmm. Russia has a fairly extensive foreign network of suppliers, just notwithstanding sanctions, notwithstanding for some of these items especially when they have dual-use application. 
still possible for Russia to obtain certain items through uh, for civilian applications. In fact, the sanctions expressly exempt certain things. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked deeply into the bearing question, but I think that's going to be their approach. And then on machine tools, a kind of a similar situation where the Russians were dependent on sort of high precision, advanced machine tools, many German machine tools, uh, and and those access to those have been been cut off as well. And how important are, are sophisticated machine tools? Those are even more important, Max, because the uh, machine tool, the Russian defense industries have been heavily relying on imports of Western machine tools, which are the most advanced in world leaders, essentially. Especially these uh, the, uh, computer numerical code machines, so-called CNC machines, which are essential for manufacturing of precision components. And they're essential for the production of things like advanced turbofan engines, submarine propulsion with quieting technologies, missiles, and a whole range of products. And uh, your report, as it points out, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the, the, the manufacturing equipment used in Russian defense base uh, has made up of these advanced Western systems. And so the cutoff of access to those systems is going to have a very pernicious effect on defense production as a whole. And I think in two principal areas. One is it's difficult for Russia to add capacity without being, gaining, without maintaining access to these machines at precisely the point that Russia wants to bring online more of its productive capacity to uh, help more quickly and more rapidly replace the losses of equipment that's incurred in Ukraine. But also has another interesting effect, and that is uh, these machines are fairly sophisticated and they have to be maintained. Mm -hmm. And they have to be, uh, for each manufacturing mission, they have to have, be programmed properly. And there's a lot of support required, spare parts, upgrades, replacements, and engineering support from the manufacturer. And Russia can no longer turn freely to the companies that supply these for that. And you can see how that can have an indirect Im impact on something that, that you and Sam talked about earlier, which is missile production. Uh, there are some reports that uh, the KH-101 production center had to be shut down for a while just because of the very facts one of their advanced uh, manufacturing systems uh, was taken offline and they had trouble getting the thing back up and running. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, you know, the, many of these Russian factories, you know, are are being told to you know, double shifts, three shifts, right. and so you're putting a lot of strain on the machine tools that, you know, Sam mentioned that, you know, they have a lot of these sophisticated machine tools so they can produce, but then if something breaks, and as something does fairly, I don't know how often, but you're, you have a production line, something breaks, you can't just go back to the original supplier. You have to figure out either how to fix it yourself, yeah. replace it yourself, or find potentially um, an inferior uh, replacement that then, uh, how does that impact your the production line? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, the fact that they have gone to three shifts is under the duress of having lost these massive amounts of equipment means that they are using these systems much more frequently, round the clock essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's going to shorten their lifespan dramatically. It's going to lead to increased breakdowns. And it's going to stress uh, defense production in a, in a variety of areas. And maybe we could turn to engines now. Mm -hmm. Really critical for, for uh, all, all sorts of aircrafts. And, and uh, how, are, how are the sanctions and export controls impacting Russia's ability to produce uh, engines? That right. would be key for, key for its military. So Russia, up until 2014, was heavily reliant on Ukraine for a range of engines of various kinds. Yeah. Right, we sort of forget that, that Ukraine and Russia, you know, it, it used to be the Soviet Union. They had an integrated defense industrial complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was true up until 2014 when suddenly you had to have this sort of decoupling. Uh, and Absolutely right. After the break of the Soviet Union about, you see different numbers, but 15 to 25 percent of the former Soviet military industrial complex found its way into Ukraine. Mm -hmm and uh, some of the other countries. Belarus and Kazakhstan were the other two most important ones, but Ukraine was the critical one. And uh, the, the pr Ukrainian production, primarily of components for uh, production, uh, d uh, producing larger systems, uh, were essential for uh, the continuation of the Russian MiG. 
And after the breakup, one of the first things that Russia and Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus did is they tried to restore these linkages mm -hmm. because they each needed each other. And uh, relations were favorable up until towards the end of the, um, you know, the, for the approach of the uh, first Ukraine crisis. And uh, Russia relied heavily on Ukrainian inputs. So they, they needed, they bought machine turbine engines for their large naval warships. Admiral Gorshkov, Admiral Grigorovich frigates, for example. Mm -hmm. They relied heavily on Motorsich, a Ukrainian company, for helicopter engines for most of their main combat helicopters. And military air, trans uh, air transport was another major problem. So most of the access to those systems were cut off in as early as late 2014, 2015. Now, at that point, Russia prioritized, even though Western sanctions had also been imposed, they prioritized uh, the need to replace these components to keep their production centers operational. Mm -hmm. And so they launched uh, several import substitution programs. And uh, they have made some progress in these area, but nevertheless, I think there's ample evidence that the, the engines that Russia is now producing internally, even though they declared victory, suffer from substantial performance mm -hmm. problems. And this may not necessarily affect uh, Russia on the battlefield in Ukraine, but if we think about Russia as the major exporter of weapons, of high-end weapons, this, this would have a, a, a clear impact on countries' willingness to acquire these systems. Absolutely. In fact, um, I, I can cite one case that um, I, I looked into for another effort, and that was the Egyptians bought several Ka-52 attack helicopters from Russia for their uh, support their ground forces, and uh, they ha they were in a leading position to make a second purchase of the naval variant of the Ka-52. But digging deeply into Egyptian sor open sources, you could find that the Egyptian Ka-52 suffered from problems, serious problems like difficulty, losing altitude, for example, <laughs> or failing to achieve the altitude necessary to operate effectively in uh, some of the difficult terrain. And, and there are uh, lots of trouble keeping those operational. So, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe last, uh, lastly, well, microchips been the major uh, focus of a lot of attention, a lot of press attention. I think rightly so. Uh, what are we seeing on Russia's ability to maintain its access to sophisticated microchips, and, and especially as, as as it's been cut off from uh, from Taiwanese microchips mm -hmm. uh, and, and <clears throat> other Western suppliers? I think this is probably the, the most important potential challenge for Russia. And I do say potential because we don't have perfect transparency, transparency into their situation at this point. Um, uh, by all accounts, sanctions could have a major impact on the papers discussed to some degree. And I know Maria will talk about some of the import substitution efforts. Um, right now, uh, well, let me put it this way. Russia's weapon systems are heavily reliant on Western chips. And uh, recent uh, examination of uh, Russian military equipment on the battlefields of Ukraine and opening those up, there's a great report by Rusi, for example, on this. Uh, most of the Russia's most advanced systems are, are littered with Western microchips of various kinds. Mm -hmm. And so they are dependent on these chips to, for the, the functioning of these systems. Yet we see that Russia has been able to, as your report very ably puts out, uh, succeed in actually increasing their import of microchips. And, uh, it, and it's likely, ver very likely, that Russia has been stockpiling microchips prior to the invasion of Ukraine, which they can continue to draw upon to sustain their um, defense production. But over time, uh, this could be could have a major impact on uh, Russia's ability to maintain defense. Production. And that should, you know, that will impact the reliability of these systems, the accuracy of these systems, if they have to sort of downgrade their right. microchips, and that will have potentially that, a real battlefield. Yeah, we're seeing that as well, right? Yeah. Well, Maria, I want to turn to you, and sorry it's taken so long, but I wanted to sort of go through some of the nitty-gritty of some of the, the weapon systems. Now, okay, so we've seen, I think, in this conversation thus far, Russia's being impacted. Um, how is it adapting? What are the prospects maybe for import substitution uh, and other 
techniques that Russia is using to try to get around uh, sanctions and export controls? Certainly, uh, and uh, the Russian authorities are quite aware of the fact that uh, sanctions are there to stay. We had uh, several announcements at the high level uh, recently. Uh, as a result, uh, they doubled down, uh, among other things, on the, their import substitution effort. Uh, the effort, I should mention, has been ongoing since at least 2014, but with a very limited success given Russia's corruption, lack of access to important high-tech uh, components and whatnot. And these issues, of course, are there to stay. If anything, they're going to be exacerbated. So a lot of the ambitious projects uh, that, that we see right now, Russian government to uh, introduce and the goals that they want to achieve are unlikely uh, really to be met. Uh, for example, among other things, uh, the Russian government recently announced uh, that they want to reduce the reliance on Western um, imported microchips, uh, mm -hmm. precisely as Paul uh, pointed out. And essentially by 2030, they want to supply around 30% of Russian households with Russian-made electronics. There is only a little bit of a small problem with that, right? That's very unlikely to happen. <laughs> uh, partly because the uh, currently only very few, about three companies up in Russia are producing uh, those microchips, even those are highly reliant on imported components. And uh, uh, there was some actual effort uh, on the side of Russian state companies to use those microchips. And even Russian uh, state companies already in early 2020, uh, 2022 complaint about the really poor qualities of those uh, microprocessors. So that is very unlikely and we see growing realization of that fact even among Russian um, officials who are saying maybe that's not going to happen. Um, nonetheless, uh, of course, the Russian government continues to invest heavily into Russia's defense uh, in an effort to boost uh, input substitution. Among other uh, com many companies, uh, Russian defense conglomerate Rostec mm -hmm. is a big recipient of these funds. In 2023 fiscal year alone, it's expected to receive about 5 billion rubles, which is roughly equivalent to $63 million, uh, which is a lot of money, obviously. There's also a lot of investment going into the private defense companies, like, for example, the um, uh, Kronstadt Group, uh, one of the producers of the Orion drones. Uh, the producer, the manufacturer of the Orion drones. Uh, again, the investment is going to be there, but historically we, we know what happens, uh, that the money ma magically disappears mm -hmm. and the result uh, either is not there or uh, the result, uh, the, the product that they uh, ultimately end up producing is suspiciously rem reminiscent of some Chinese versions, for example, of the same uh, component or the same sort of um, uh, weapon. Uh, so that is very unlikely to be successful. Nonetheless, I agree, of course, with Paul and Sam that we need to monitor, keep monitoring this closely. So, just on that, so essentially, you know, the some Russian officials or companies may make a lot of promises, get huge contracts, and then their ability to deliver on that would be likely very limited uh, or maybe very limited. There may be a degree of corruption here. Uh, is that is that what that's pretty much likely to happen? Yeah, I don't want to uh, say that they're not going to be able to produce anything at all. I think we need to be cautious there, right? In case of Iran, we've seen somewhat successful effort at import substitution, and Russia probably will somewhat succeed with something, but nowhere near to meet this its ambitious import substitution goals. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to ask what the impact of, of the uh, immigration and migration out of Russia has maybe done to Russia's ability to do import substitution. That's not in the report, but mm -hmm. um, as someone who tracks Russia, that it strikes me that uh, you know the mobilization also led to a mobilization of, of really motivated and highly educated people leaving Russia. Leaving Russia. Uh, and it strikes me that those are the very people that you would want to be tapping right now to figure out how to redesign some of the machine tools that Paul was talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the IT sector is one of these uh, crucial places, areas where people, uh, it's very easy to flee when you have um, um, the IT skills. That's because they're in high demand everywhere. It's also possible to work for Russia outside of the country. That's what many IT specialists 
nationalists are doing these days. So uh, the fact that they're fleeing does not necessarily mean that they're mm -hmm. not uh, available uh, to provide the services for the right, Russian state. Right, just on state. that, it's so some of the companies have said, you can go work from home abroad so you're not yeah. then susceptible potentially to And we know that's happening. Mobilized. In Kazakhstan, for yeah. example, they're working, physically pres being present in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. but they're working for the Russian state. So that's important to keep in mind. Having said that, we see that the Russian state is very, very concerned specifically about the uh, disappearance of the IT uh, specialist, and they're trying their best, at least they've been trying their best until recently, to uh, attract those specialists, even offering them some sort of uh, protection against uh, being mobilized for the, uh, to fight in this war. And you know, one of the Russian tactics that would strike me also is, is a bit of triage, where uh, trying to get sort of microchips from wherever they can get it, whether it's from importing washing machines and taking them out of, of advanced, you know, washing, uh, you know, modern washing machines, or their car sector, for instance, which, uh, you know, the latest models don't have airbags and don't have some of the sophisticated electronics. Uh, it, it, so essentially, maybe they'll be able to maintain some production. Uh, on the defense side, but that's going to impact other parts of the economy. Is that that's part of what probably we're also true? We've seen, for example, the aviation, the civil aviation uh, industry suffering very badly in uh, in Russia while they're actually trying to uh, somewhat preserve the defense uh, aviation sector. Um, uh, it's uh, also true that even when they import, for example, microchips from uh, countries like China, up to 30 to 40 percent of those end up being defective. Mm -hmm. uh, they also use uh, some of the microchips, extensively use the microchips that are not actually uh, made, de designed for uh, defense purposes. Uh, they are using those uh, in the military. Uh, those, of course, are very likely to um, end up not delivering as well. Um, because this is just commercial components that are not designed to be used uh, in defense. Yeah. Uh, so expect more probably of the casualties and accidents as a result of this effort. I want to talk more about China in a second. Maybe we'll, we'll go to all, all the panels to, to, uh, on the potential role of China and, and how it could help the Russian military. But um, you know, part of what we're also seeing is that Russia is very, uh, they have a large intelligence service. They, they are trying to figure out how to get around sanctions. What are the things that you're sort of seeing and perhaps how it's working with, with other countries in, in the neighborhood? Yeah, well, I don't really expect Russia to be highly successful with import substitution domestically. Mm -hmm. Sanctions evasion is something that Russia always uh, mustered, and this probably uh, will be still the case. Since the start of the war and the imposition of the sanctions, we've seen an emergence of multiple alternative routes for which Russia smuggles um, uh, the uh, banned um, components. Uh, among uh, many, a variety of those, in this report, we emphasize the key ones where we believe the, uh, the Western policymakers should pay particular attention. Uh, Iran, of course, in particular, it's already been highlighted that Shahed drones, for example, uh, the big uh, part of the supplies that Iran uh, provides to Russia. One particular aspect of Iran-Russia uh, collaboration that I wanted to flag is that Iran has this poorly monitored border with uh, Iraq, which, and Iraq still gets a lot of Western components uh, from the US, for example. And a lot of those components, unfortunately, often end up in Iran because of that situation, and then they may also go to Russia because there's a really increased strong collaboration and a long sanction evading rails emerging between the two countries. So this is an area where I think the United States may uh, pay particular attention uh, going forward. Uh, there's also this Caspian Sea, uh, the, 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 the rail, the link uh, along the coast of the Caspian Sea that is emerging uh, between Iran and Russia. There's a lot of ambitious uh, projects uh, that the Kremlin has been announcing recently. There are, however, some uh, doubts about uh, the ability of both countries to be very successful in, explo in exploring um, that route uh, because, uh, for example, Russia is unlikely to have the uh, ships, the capacity needed to uh, continue smuggling goods through this route. China, of course, and uh, I think we'll discuss this more, uh, primarily through provision of the dual-use goods, because China wants to be careful not to become the target of the Western sanctions itself. But we've seen repeatedly the provision of, uh, say, civilian hunting ri rifles mm -hmm. or some drones um, uh, through often routed via Turkey or the United Arab Emirates or other destinations, potentially even Belarus. Uh, that, of course, should be also monitored closely. 
uh, in our report, among other places, we also uh, call to pay attention to the Balkan Peninsula, uh, in particular Serbia and other smaller countries like or Republic Srpska, for example, where it's very common for intermediary companies that, again, help to smuggle um, components, goods, uh, they end up being registered. And this is, for example, how a Ukrainian uh, company, Motorpsik, has been supplying helicopter engines through an intermediary company uh, that, which was uh, based in Republic of Srpska. Turkey, of course, everybody has been discussing Turkey for quite a while. Uh, it's another important um, destination for smuggling sanctioned goods. Recently, they actually have become more careful in uh, rejecting transit declarations that have Russian and Belarusian end users. But there's no doubt that Turkey will continue be, uh, be, to continue, continue to be a very important uh, destination for these purposes. Last but not the least, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, the countries that are part of it, uh, these are the land routes, highly important for sanctions uh, avoidance. The key here is that the Eurasian Economic Union uh, does not require uh, the additional sort of um, the, the additional red tape for Russia. Yeah. Essentially, all the all the uh, paperwork is taken care of, which makes it very very easy for Russia to smuggle goods through countries like Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. uh, we should definitely pay more attention to this country. So this would essentially be your you're an American company, you get an order from. Uh, some company you've never heard of in Kazakhstan that says, you know, we really want to buy this microchip or this, this machine that you have. And you think, great, we have an order. This isn't Russia. This is all good. And you ship it to those countries, and then it's actually a front to then. You say there's no customs check because it's a customs union. It's sort of the Russian answer to the European Union in some ways. Exactly, and there's some anecdotal evidence that it's, the situation has become so bad that some companies uh, that are shipping, for example, to Kazakhstan, they ask their uh, customers to actually appear on Zoom, mm -hmm. film themselves, and film their destination, to mm -hmm. film the location, so they they can prove physically that they're actually in Kazakhstan and not in Russia. Yeah. That, of course, is still not unlikely to be the solution because what is to stop you to, you know, Zoom mm -hmm. from Kazakhstan and then still, right. you know, smuggle yeah. goods to Russia? I think one of those things that uh, it's it, one of the challenges of always sanctions and export controls is the enforcement side. And one of the things I've been hearing recently is that actually there's been a lot, of, a lot of energy and effort put into enforcement, so a lot of companies are very nervous, and so hence are insisting on those sort of protocols and, and are very are been somewhat reluctant. But I want to turn to China and maybe uh, to Paul and Sam and then to Maria, where it, you know there's been a lot of talk in the news about Russia asking China for weaponry, uh, for arms. Um, what do we make of that? Is that a sign that? Russia is really struggling with defense production, um, or you know, how could China sort of be very you know useful in this case? Maybe Sam, we haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, this is probably a question that's occupying uh, a lot of attention right now in Washington D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, the China-Russian military partnership is, uh, is is a topic of great discussion right now, and uh, a lot of attention is paid to probably every word. Uh, said by the Russian Chinese officials when it comes to military uh, industrial cooperation. And these countries have been discussing this cooperation for quite a while. In fact, their um, partnership and uh, in military technologies have been certainly new. Uh, Russia turning to China for specific technologies is indicative of probably narrow and more specific components that Russian military may need going forward, such as microchips, such as microelectronics, especially those for I mean, aerial vehicles and for the commercial trucks. But probably other technologies can also be sort of uh, um, on, the, on the table, such as uh, um, trucking or logistics or uh, oil munitions or other type of technology. So um, it is interesting that um, these discussions aren't necessarily uh, shared widely across Russia with respect to what is Russia actually needing from China when compared to, for example, lots and lots of discussions across the Russian language sources on. Uh, Iranian Russian cooperation and what the Russians are probably doing from Iran. But it is a very important uh, step going forward as both countries are uh, looking to sort of uh, continue and uh, increase their military cooperation. Um, 
I think in a few days, uh, Chinese defense minister is going to travel to Russia uh, for high level discussions. Uh, Russians and Chinese have had significant high level discussions for quite a while. Publicly, China wants to distance itself from um, getting involved in the war in Ukraine. As I said publicly, it doesn't want to uh, basically be directly involved. But um, realistically, uh, that probably remains to be seen, especially uh, depending on what kind of deal and agreement both the Russians and the Chinese can arrive at uh, when it comes to their cooperation. Paul, I'm curious for, for your thoughts. Right, I think uh, Sam's tracking this uh, properly. Um, Russia and China have a very deep military and defense cooperation program that dates back to the end of the Cold War. And uh, mostly it's been in the direction of Russia providing China with military systems and technologies. And even uh, from 1991 to 2005, uh, Russia was exporting anywhere from two to three billion dollars of weapon systems a year uh, to help the Chinese to uh, leapfrog in the development of their own military capabilities and their own defense production. Um, we've seen a transition more recently of that particular prong of, of cooperation to joint development mm -hmm. and uh, co-production. Co and I, I think what's ended up happening is since 2014, the secondary sanctions have been imposed on Russia for companies that buy from Russia, like the Katza sanctions, have driven a lot of this cooperation underground between Russia and China. Um, I think the military connectivity is still happening in, in that particular direction. Um, most of that, even the technology, joint technology projects, have been of the nature of Russia providing some core technology that China wants to incorporate in some new weapon system. So it's benefited China, again, more favorably to Russia. Now, looking at the flip side of what is Russia getting from China, we have seen a change over the last several years in which uh, uh, China has been more actively involved in Russia's domestic uh, industries. Huawei, for example, has established uh, business in Russia, although uh, it seems to have vacated that under the pressure of the 2022 sanctions. Hmm. Um, but overall, we've seen Russia, uh, China re refrain from providing a lot of military components and technology uh, in violation of the, the U.S. secondary sanctions regime. And they did that as well after 2014. They've been very careful not to cross that line because they, their companies have so much dependence on foreign exports to the West. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to find their companies uh, iced out of those markets. Um, <clears throat> but we have seen them resort to certain things like uh, do, uh, civilian equipment that may have military applications. Uh, we've seen body armor and uh, small, small arms. Uh, we've seen a, a influx, an increase in uh, uh, electronics, and uh, we have also seen some things that fly under the radar, like some precursors for ammunition, chemicals were reported recently. Uh, but my own sense is that even though uh, China has been making noises about ramping up production, and, and their uh, their uh, foreign minister uh, complained when the U.S. had uh, warned them against this, that uh, you know we are independent, a country capable of supporting uh, uh, Russia if we decide that's in, in our best interest. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I, in my own sense is they're going to hesitate to do that uh, until things become a little more dire for Russia. I mean, there's been reports of, of sort of Russia starting to have to husband its artillery, for instance. And I imagine the Chinese, you know, if they opened up the spigot, started providing Russia with artillery, it would kind of solve some of those, those basic equipment challenges and ammunition, yeah. which is really uh, the limiting factor even more than artillery to some extent in Ukraine because the great expenditure of ammunition in this war on both sides has really uh, surprised, uh, I think, both their own military leaders and those uh, throughout the world have looked at this uh, uh, conflict and, and realized that uh, the ability to, to, to maintain the, uh, military operations requires on much larger initial stocks and much larger replenishment capability. So if uh, China were to ramp up the uh, delivery of ammunition or to help Russia increase its own production, that could have a, a fairly significant effect on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You've seen Russia turn to the DPRK and Iran as alternative sources for uh, artillery. 
They're working with, uh, with Belarus to try to increase the production of certain uh, uh, artillery platforms, components, and so forth. So there's a lot of activity in this area. Mm -hmm. Maria, to, to turn to you, I mean, this we've seen, I think, the numbers bear it out that that an increase in, Ru in Chinese uh, uh, exports to Russia, that Russia is uh, uh, buying many more goods fr from China. Uh, in some ways, have we seen the kind of in uh, economic interaction that, that used to occur between Russia and Europe is sort of now completely shifted to Russia and China? Not completely, but certainly uh, at least partly. <clears throat> For example, Russia definitely rearranges its sales of energy, of oil, mm -hmm. to the Asian markets, China included. Uh, the problem is that China, first of all, is not eager to become fully dependent on Russia in that regard. The lesson learned <laughs> what happens if you get too dependent on Russia's um, expo imports. And second, uh, this is just uh, limits to how much it can uh, import. So that actually why one of the reasons uh, why uh, EU energy embargo in Russia is actually likely to be quite successful. There's just not enough alternative routes uh, to um, reorient it to. Uh, but most importantly, I actually wanted to follow up on what Sam and Paul said. Uh, there's actually some cautious optimism about uh, China, is that uh, throughout this uh, last year, it has shown itself quite careful, right, not to become subject to the Western sanctions. It seems that for China, the sanctions may end up being much more consequential than they are for Russia, like for better or worse, mm -hmm. just because of the way uh, its economy is structured. And so in that regard, the Western policymakers, they retain a lot of leverage over China, which hopefully will help limit the amount of, uh, you know, weapons or munition supplies to Russia. Yeah, I think it's it, it's really fascinating that the Chinese decision making here. I know that the the White House, for instance, was very concerned, came out publicly uh, roughly a month ago. Jake Sullivan went on the Sunday shows and said um, that China was thinking about uh, providing arms to Russia. I do wonder if, if Emmanuel Macron's uh, visit which is, uh, to, hmm. to China, which has caused a lot of uproar, my kind of hot take on that was that uh, it may have actually been beneficial to Ukraine because if the if at all in Chinese thinking was that we don't want to provide if we provide arms to Russia that the Europeans will that will really push the Europeans fully al to align with the United States uh, and have them adopt a much hawkish much more hawkish stance. I think they may be hoping that there's potential positive economic relations there to be had with France. So maybe that will, uh, looking for a bright side out of a trip that was uh, controversial to, to say the least. Um, I want to maybe turn to the battlefield and to uh, how, um, you know, we're now, uh, you know, uh, seeing a, a Russian offensive that I guess is still ongoing. It doesn't appear to be making uh, major gains. I'm curious when we look at the Russian, the current Russian offensive um, uh, over the last few months, what does that tell you right now about the kind of state of the Russian military, about its current, the quality of its equipment, the quality of its force? Uh, Sam, maybe to, to start with you. Well, we're seeing a combination of modern equipment and uh, an increasingly growing share of some of the very, very less sophisticated equipment. Both are used with mixed effect, but Russia is conducting an additional campaign, a slow grinding advance against the internal forces, especially in places like uh, the city of Bakhmut, which is probably going to be an example of how Russian military is going to conduct its operations in this war. Russian military is anticipating a Ukrainian counteroffensive, so they've been digging in and uh, establishing fortifications uh, and strongholds. So they are basically preparing for a grinding type of warfare, a traditional type of warfare, well into this year and possibly 2024. And in this type of warfare, sophisticated weapons certainly have an effect, but it really um, is what's happening at the tactical level that really plays a very important part. And at this very tactical level, less sophisticated weapons can actually be quite successful and quite powerful. For example, Russian, as well as Ukrainian use of commercial uh, aerial drones, is impacting how Russian military and Ukrainian defenders are conducting their attacks and counter attacks. And this is a very cheap commercial technology that's readily available. So, uh, this type of attritional campaign may continue. It isn't exactly clear how long it may last and what the final outcome is going to be, and whether or not either Russians and Ukrainians have sort of enough resources for a long-term campaigning, but certainly when it comes to 
um, certainly when it comes to the Russian military, um, they um, they are preparing sort of to make a stand across the entire front to fortify themselves in anticipation of uh, the Ukrainian advance. And uh, again, uh, this is not um, necessarily where very sophisticated weapons can have a significant impact, unless, of course, they are used in conjunction with sort of um, other uh, weapons and as a larger strategic um, sort of campaign, such as, for example, Russian use of shot-head loading munitions to strike in the Ukrainian rear, to strike at the Ukrainian um, infrastructure as the Ukrainians are possibly preparing for this event. Paul, curious for, for your take on, on, on how you saw the, the current Russian offensive and whether it was sort of impacted by the sanctions and export controls. And it's, uh, it certainly has been impacted to some degree by the sanctions regime. It's a little difficult to uh, point to any particular factor that has been decisive. Uh, but we've seen that Russia's ability to maneuver has been limited much more than most analysts expected at the beginning of the campaign, uh, primarily because um, <clears throat> the battle the battle space in Ukraine it, it's it's under continuous surveillance. It's very difficult for forces to concentrate to conduct effective armored operations, and uh, Russia's uh, it's true it's true of Russia. It's also true of Ukraine. And so that, that, what we've seen is that artillery and precision fires have been much more decisive weapons in the campaign up to this point and uh, have, uh, have hampered the ability of both sides to conduct offensive operations. Um, now, Ukraine did have success in uh, earlier in the, the, in the Kharkov area when it was able to, um, uh, to brush aside some fairly weak Russian forces of Ross, Ross Guardia and some others and, and actually was able to successfully maneuver. But since then, the uh, Russian battle, f the, uh, the front has been stabilized under the efforts of uh, General Sorovikin, who took advantage of the mobilization, brought a lot of equipment online, and uh, managed to, um, to uh, stabilize the front. But since then, uh, the Russians have been conducting this very intensive offensive into uh, Bakhmut, uh, with the, uh, but it hasn't really succeeded in making that much progress. Uh, for them to be able to, to do better, they're going to have to sustain art artillery production at higher levels. They're going to have to uh, bring to bear more, uh, more of its uh, precision strike or, uh, weapon systems. The, uh, the lack of precision artillery has uh, is caused a problem for Russian sustaining offenses because uh, having to use mass fires has been less effective for them. So that's one thing that's been affected by sanctions as well. But ultimately, um, uh, I think the Russians have uh, left themselves to a position where they're exposing themselves to a potential counteroffensive. And uh, over the next few months, having expended all the, these, these equipment and supplies, uh, there's a window of opportunity for, for Ukraine. And I think uh, we'll, have, we'll have to see how that all plays out. Mm -hmm. Maria, to, to you, I mean, the other aspect of sanctions and export controls, which is really important, is that it's impacting the Russian economy, which then impacts Russia's ability to um, sustain the war, to pay uh, uh, workers in factories to do double and triple shifts. Um, uh, what are we now seeing with the kind of Russian economy and the, and the, the Russian deficit, and, and how is Russia fiscally able to kind of maintain this? Uh, we have realized last year that uh, energy producing economies, right, uh, when they sanctioned, uh, the energy should be sanctioned first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moderate or lack of uh, significant success of the sanctions throughout 2022 was primarily because of the, the, the negative effect was almost completely offset uh, by the uh, influx of unprecedented energy revenues to Russia. Uh, so once the, that realization uh, kind of uh, was uh, uh, became, became was perceived by policymakers, and uh, once the EU was able to negotiate the energy uh, sanctions by the end of last year, this is when uh, we saw the actually the effect of sanctions. Um, become being, being felt by the Russian economy. Since uh, January, 
2023, uh, we've seen that the deficit of the Russian budget has become really pronounced. Actually, in, the, in January, Russia had the largest budget, January budget deficit since 1998, which was the crisis year in Russia. Uh, and since then, uh, there was actually a number of other factors that contributed to such uh, high um, deficit. Since then, um, Russian, the Kremlin has taken certain measures, including a modification of the uh, tax uh, rate um, levied on the Russian oil producing companies, which will help somewhat moderate the effects of the sanctions. But nonetheless, uh, it will, it's hard to um, understand where uh, and how the Kremlin is going to be uh, actually able to find uh, additional revenues, if not by increasing sanctions, uh, increasing printing money or increasing inflation in Russia, increasing debt. So most likely, um, this is the, are the steps that the Kremlin will have to take in order to compensate you know, for the effect of the uh, sanctions. Having said that, I still believe that there's more to be done uh, by the West, despite all this commendable mm -hmm. effort that's already been in place. And, uh, for example, one of the obvious directions where the effort can be targeted is by lowering uh, the oil price cap, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. will again uh, further dec likely further decrease the revenues that Russian uh, budget, Russia's oil companies uh, have. Yeah, and of course, last but not the least, it's really important to keep providing more weapons to Ukraine in order to help it fight this war. No, I think that's a, a great way to potentially close us out. We have just a few minutes left and to talk about what are the, the things that, that, that could be done, some of the recommendations about how to, what do we need to do in terms of strengthening sanctions or, uh, or supporting Ukraine or, or, or taking action against Russia? What are the things that we're not doing? Um, uh, it's a loaded question. Uh, but maybe, maybe Maria, we'll start with you. You mentioned providing weapons to, to Ukraine. What about on the sanction side? Are, are there other things? Um, I think, uh, as I keep saying, it's very important for the West to understand what sort of goals uh, we want to achieve in this war. Right. Uh, the recent uh, Pentagon leaks, for example, suggest that uh, there's some um, uh, skepticism on the side of the U.S. administration as to how successful Ukraine can be in its counteroffensive. But the problem is the success of Ukraine is partly conditional by the weapons uh, that the administration is supplying. And while it's been doing a completely commendable work, I think it's fairly clear a year in, it's fairly easy, right, to understand what can what is achievable and how much of the western support is needed in order to get there uh, i would love to see more clear understanding on the side of the western policymakers what it is that they want to achieve in this goal given their limitations and whatnot and therefore with that in mind to accelerate provision of the weapons which as we know unfortunately not enough to radically alter the result of this war having said that uh, when it comes to the sanctions uh, the low-hanging fruit has been collected, but there's a price cap that can be lowered. There are secondary sanctions that need to be reinforced to close, for example, the land routes and all these smuggling routes that help Russia to circumvent sanctions that we've discussed. Uh, there's also ways to go after all these uh, sh shady routes uh, in, for which Russia, for example, continuously able to ship oil uh, to um, even to the, those places that actually technically sanctioned mm -hmm. Russia's oil. And uh, you know, Russia just m mixes its oil with alternative oil, and uh, this allows it to actually reach to uh, various places. So secondary sanctions are the key. I've seen actually the U.S. administration doing a lot of really great um, effort in that regard, but unfortunately, more remains to be done. Paul, final, final thoughts or things that should be done. So I think to strengthen the sanctions regime, one thing that is happening right now is a lot of uh, very smart people are looking at how can we better identify Russian illicit networks and then how do we disrupt them and, uh, and stop the flow of uh, banned items to Russia. And uh, there's a, kind of a larger development in the field of looking at the rise of ubiquitous surveillance methods. State actors can bring to bear big data, AI, uh, machine learning, and various surveillance tools to try to ferret out covert activities. And I think there's uh, a lot of thinking that this could be useful for de identifying these, these kinds of networks. Um, I have some doubts about it, but it's, it's, it's something that holds a lot of promise. It's, 
fairly uh, easy once you have a clue to identify the linkages between, say, an entity that you suspect or an individual, um, and then to start to build out the networks to, 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 to identify places where to look closer. The problem is that there's usually a breaking point between this, uh, sh these shell companies that then uh, transfers the item to somebody who doesn't show up in the, the normal linkages. Yeah. So, so I think uh, that's one thing that could be done. I think another thing that I've been thinking a lot about is supplementing sanctions by um, other methods. For example, the Russian defense industry, its shipbuilding capacity, this little less relevant to Ukraine, but it will illustrate the point, um, has limited their, they do, they do quite well in producing advanced submarines, but their, uh, their ability to produce larger warships is very limited. And uh, they rely on uh, exports in some respects for uh, resources, especially hard currency, to support uh, sh the development of that industry. Uh, targeting some of their, their uh, clients' states, uh, convincing them to buy other kinds of weapons, uh, so looking at ways to cut off some of their, their other revenue sources, could have a, and coupled with sanctions, a synergistic effect on helping to cripple some of their defense production. Yeah, I think some of the illicit networks, you know, Russia is going to be very good at that. On the other hand, if you're trying to run production lines at, at this sort of accelerated rate, that any disruption there causes uh, causes some, causes issues. So, yeah. um, the, the great suggestions there. Uh, Sam, to you. Well, I, I agree with that. Uh, there's Marie and Paul. I think these are uh, the most important suggestions we outlined in the paper. Um, I, I would also um, I would also point out, and we are alluding to that in the paper, that it isn't always possible to simply shut down the company like Russia. And simply prevent the flow of new and commercial technologies that can enable the military. We've seen time and time again, and there's, uh, there's evidence in the paper, uh, Russia can find numerous ways, quite creative at times, for acquiring technologies and resources that you need to really more on new partners, partners. And I think we have to keep that in mind. And to a certain extent, we as analysts, we have to be realistic with respect to a country like Russia. That doesn't mean that we cannot put enough pressure on the Russian defense industry and the civilian industry to elicit a desired outcome. At the same time, a country like Russia with lots of partners, with uh, lots of uh, willing entities that can uh, be quite creative in supplying and acquiring materials, a country like that um, is um, could be quite a difficult thing when it comes to sanctions and filtering. Great. Well, well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Paul. I think it's a really good way to wrap up. I mean, I think the, the report out of stock assessing the impact of sanctions on Russia's defense industry. Uh, again, you should uh, go to CSIS.org. You can download the report. I think as Sam clo closed, the basic finding is that we've sanctions are having an impact. Russia is going to be able to maintain its war fighting machine, uh, but but it's having an impact on having and making that machine uh, uh, a little bit less uh, in terms of quality and, and its ability to, to, to wreak havoc. So, um, uh, and hopefully we will see uh, Ukraine make advances uh, uh, soon in, it, in its counteroffensive that's coming. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us uh, and, and thank our, our panelists very much for what was a really uh, excellent conversation. Thank you all uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.